Um, the original Zionist slogan that you open up your piece with, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land, um, what inspired you to write the piece? Uh, I did recently see that you quote tweeted a scene from Left Forum uh, where a person, I can't remember the guy's name, said the biggest blow to capitalism will be the destruction of Israel. Uh, was this piece not in response to that? Because I think you published your piece before that clip got started to get played. Not, not in response to that clip exactly, but a challenge to that perspective. Um, also, do you see that perspective as the dominant perspective in decolonial studies? Mm -hmm. Well, the or the provenance of that came from obviously after Ottoman and you know the beginning of Israel's bombardment of Gaza. Um, it you know there was a lot of discourse uh, about settler colonialism going all over the place and uh there was certain articles published in you know mainstream media that were kind of trying to push back against it so like in the atlantic mm -hmm. there was a essay from a british historian um simon stayback montefiore that was mm -hmm. basically denouncing like any claim to call israel settler colonial colonial as basically you know anti-semitic or uh very narrow-minded and you know there are other is published to that effect and i wanted to sort of intervene within this argument to clarify mm. you know that title comes from to sort of clarify this question as to whether israel can be classified as a settler colonial state and i wanted mm. to do it quite minded and objective to, you know and without being tendentious about it um or p using settler colonial as purely a rhetorical sort of device. let's let's sort of analyze it concretely and historically whether israel is a or and the zionist movement is settler colonial and i as i argue i think yes it is i think a very reasonable person can make that argument and you know and that's where I make that distinction between, you know, colonialism and settler colonialism, because, you know, very often these terms can be very much conflated and all like settler colonialism is sort of seen as just colonialism on steroids rather than its own separate um, thing. So, you know, I, I make the, so when we talk about settler colonies, mm -hmm. we can talk about, you know, the new world, like the United States, Canada, virtually all of Latin America, all settler <laughs> colonial states in, in that they originate from a settler population that um, mass migrated over years into these lands and then created their own peace and social orders that superseded and you know tore away the native uh societies and orders that preceded them you know so uh so like obviously the united states was mm -hmm. built on the ruins of the various native tribes that populated these places like you know the osage if you watched um, killers of the flower moon recently yeah. you know that that's yeah. just like the quintessential example of it and and so when i talk about israel i also sort of say that israel at least israel in the 1948 borders is more like argentina or the us in that they that part of israel was erected on was successfully erected on the ruins of the palestinian society that preceded it hence you know that's why the nakba happened you know the yeah. mass expulsion of 750,000 palestinian arabs without which the jewish majority israel would not come into being mm -hmm. while the west bank you know the settlement on the west bank has more parallels with 
um, French Algeria or uh, even um, British Kenya in that you have a minority of settlers within a hostile native majority who are sponsored and protected by a mother country, i.e. Israel. You know? <laughs> well, can you, can you talk about that difference, though, between the, the West Bank and, and, and that settler project? Because you're comparing it to Algeria, and I don't know how many people watching the show right now or listening right now know kind of the history of Algeria and what happened when that settler population just up and went back to, to France. Um, it's not necessarily the same when we talk about the, the early days of Israel. Yeah, I think because the West Bank, and this is, this is one thing that makes Zionism a bit peculiar and why some people may be uh, hesitant to call it settler colonial because, you know, the official proclamation of the Zionist movement is these are the Jews returning to their mm -hmm. ancestral homeland. This is, you know, so to speak, the indigenous people coming back. So how can you call land it? back? This is land yeah. back in real time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how can you call it settler colonial if uh, it's the indigenous people returning? And, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't returning to found a new Vilnius or a new Krakow like, you know, the American colonists founded in Sudan or New York, you know, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. they, so to speak, restored old biblical and Talmudic place names and towns. Like, so that's one reason why people kind of find it difficult. And yeah, so like the West Bank kind of fits more with say French Algeria because they see it like I said it's like you know a minority of settlers who are mm -hmm. kind of trying to entrench themselves and rule the place in the midst of a native majority and obviously the, it's kind of a little bit subtle because French Algeria was seen as literally part of France mm -hmm. Like it was like inseparable from France itself. So there was, so, and just like, you know, the West Bank, a lot of, you know, hardened Zionists think that that's inseparable from Eretz Israel, you know, the, the whole land of Israel, that this is part of the a process through which, you know, it, the Jewish homeland is made complete, so to speak. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, and obviously that comes in tandem with more dispossession, more expulsions, more um, pressure on you know the Palestinian Arabs in the West Bank to either kind of leave or you know dispossess them of land to make kind of any sense of social life impossible for them. Mm -hmm. Um, also, you know, I kind of want to bring back that, uh, that, that quote that you quote tweeted, um, the destruction of Israel is going to be the biggest blow to capitalism. Um, you don't agree with that perspective? No, because, um, Israel is just one capitalist nation state and, and, you know, I'm a kind of old fashioned Marxist about it, that capitalism can only be overcome internationally and trying to find one kind of scapegoat mm -hmm. as a nation state and say, if we, if only, if only we destroyed them, if only we took the <laughs> Jewish state out, then ah, that'll be the biggest blow to capitalism ever. When, you know, just leaving aside like the morality, the moral implications of it, capitalism could just will just reconstitute itself without Israel. You know? mm. <laughs> so, and and then, why do you think yeah. there's so much focus? Sorry, to, to, yeah, that's fine. Uh, why do you think there's so much focus on that relation, Israel Palestine, and not other colonial relations that exist, especially in places like Africa? Um. I think that there are many reasons for it because one reason is it's the holy land you know so mm. uh 
so for the two biggest religions on earth you know which have christianity and islam which have four billion you know <laughs> followers all across the world that what goes on in that part of the world you know is very very important and so and that's very different from say you know western sahara with which ha which is very similar to palestine in in many ways but you know it just doesn't it just, just doesn't tap into you know popular consciousness like palestine does you know because mm -hmm. it, it is the holy land um another side of it is a kind of third worldist you know kind of anti imperialism that kind of sees i know israel as the mother load of imperialism you know mm -hmm. and if you took took israel out you're somehow kind of dealing a mo mortal blow to america you know <laughs> and and you know and th and there's this aspect of it which is has the kind of subliminal anti-semitism to it you know that think you know israel has this sort of titanic power behind that it kind of has such a big influence on world affairs uh, which i think is just you know completely wrong-headed um also you talk about kind of the the definition of the nation state that really comes to be in the post enlightenment era can you you know get into that definition of how we see oh, yeah. the nation state today oh yeah cuz with from in the 18th century with the starts of the american french revolutions that's where we see the first modern conception of the nation as we understand it today and you know in the french and american revolutionary traditions the nation is you know formed by the people sovereignty lays in the people as opposed to the king and you know the nation is a political entity it's formed through you know democratic republican values so that on principle at least then there should be no racial cultural ethnic even linguistic barriers to becoming part of the nation and mm. this idea of the nation was also noted for being very universal you know universalistic and historically transient that mm. you know that it was a part of a movement a process through which a more universal form of social organization could arise so i quote for example the uh french revolutionary who was also prussian anarchist clutes who said that you know one day we will all say the world is my native land the world is my country you mm. know you can find a similar sentiment in thomas paine when he says you know my religion my religion is to go do good my only country is the world that sort of thing mm -hmm. um and then after the napoleonic wars we see uh another different forms of the definition of the nation one is a more cultural form of it which mm -hmm. is more subtle and you know you see this with mazzini but even with mazzini he's kind of saw it as a stepping stone to a more universal you know form of organization so he didn't really see his cultural conception of the nation as um sort of a permanent for all time that and even that people could you know integrate into this nation um where and then but then there's another form of definition from the german romantic tradition which is more racial or volkish which mm -hmm. has a very uh enclosed um vision of the nation that it's based on blood and race and uh, yeah. yeah blood and soil that's where it all comes from mm -hmm. that you know uh, your patch of land a particular patch of land belongs inherently to a particular people because of a unique 
mystical ancestral you know connection to it and and even this form of nationalism is not voluntaristic like not everybody could join it because it's based on blood and if you don't join mm. if you're not part of the blood lineage you're not part of the nation and therefore you can't be part of the state even so that's that's kind of the a rough um survey of how uh the various definitions of nationalisms since the 18th century and the 19th century.